So let's see if I've got this straight. From the beautiful town of Listowel, Ontario, to nearby Elmira and a stint with the Sugar Kings, onto the Kitchener Rangers of the OHL, and now in the mountains of Utah, with just a few stops in between, Larry Harris, would that be fair to say? Yeah, there's there's been a few stops along the way for sure. I mean, it's uh, I've had a very interesting life, Mike, and uh, um, I wouldn't switch it for anything. I mean, are there things some things I do differently? Maybe. Uh, but I think overall, I think that uh, it worked out pretty well. I think there's uh, not that many people uh, can spend their whole life in hockey and retire out of that. And uh, I was very fortunate. I mean, I grew up in a in a great, uh, great community, uh, a lot of support. Like I played my minor hockey. I started my minor hockey actually in Milberton, Ontario. And then uh, we moved down just outside of Waterloo. And then that's when I got started with the, uh, the Elmira Minor Hockey Association. So they really got things going for me. And I mean, I don't have a lot of claims to fame, Mike, I said, but one of the ones I do have is I was an original member of the 1971 Elmira Sugar Kings. So that's what I, that's what I hang my hat on. So um, it was really, my timing was really fortunate because I grew up with some really good uh, hockey players. And uh, we just seemed to keep moving along and we'd win and we'd win. And then, and then it got to a point where had I not, had they not started that Elmira Sugar Kings team, I would have been a water assistant. So heaven forbid, you know, but uh, uh, anyways, it worked. I think we had nine, nine guys off of our midget team went and played junior B the next year. And out of those nine, I think four of us got drafted to the OHL. So uh, it was uh, just had a really great opportunity to go up with a great bunch of guys. Well, that Sugar Kings team, as I'm sure you know, is still the stuff of royalty on the Junior B loop here in this part of Ontario. And you go from there to, of all places, the Kitchener Rangers. What was the transition like for you going from Elmira to the big city of Kitchener? Well, my coach in Elmira that time was Jerry Forler. Jerry Forler, again, an ex uh, an ex coach of the Kitchener Rangers. But uh, Jerry was a very low key. Like, he was a teacher. You know, like he was a teacher by profession and that's the way that he coached. So Jerry was all very level headed. Did he get excited once in a while? Yeah, absolutely. Like all coaches do. But uh, he was very supportive and uh, uh, a really a great communicator. Now, I went from, you know, having this group of guys and coaches I've been with all my life. I went to the Kitchen Rangers uh, where uh, I met Mr. Eddie Bush and uh, that was like 180 degrees uh, from, from what I was doing. So it took a little bit of adapting. Uh, so, uh, but the, the years I had in Kitchener was, was great. I had a good time. It took me a little while to get going, but uh, it ended up, I, I got to play with some really good players there as well and had a really great time. Why do you say it took you a while to get going? What was the adjustment? What made it difficult? Well, I mean, I think it was, you know, uh, it was a kind of a style. Like I had a, I had a certain type of game that I played, and they drafted me. I was, I was, I was not a bad player when I was 16 years old, Mike. I was, uh, I was number one draft choice to Kitchener, number four overall. Uh, and uh, so I had, you know, it was news to me. I mean, I was just, I was just playing hockey. You know, that I went that high was kind of a surprise. But I, I'd always been kind of an offensive-minded defenseman, like rushing the puck and all that. And uh, when I got to uh, Kitchener, I mean, Eddie, he was hell bent on knocking that out of me right away. So changed my style. I remember I remember one time he's, he was talking would be putting it lightly. Let's put let's he was encouraging very, very uh, voraciously. Let's put it that way. <laughs> he said, keep your ass back on the blue line. The day we have to count on you to score goals, we're really in trouble. So that was that was pretty much it. So I went from being kind of offensive rushing type of defenseman to a staying home type of physical defensive kind of guy. And uh, I think too, just adapting, you know, where I had been uh, with the same guys and uh, for so many years, and now you come into a team where you didn't know anybody and just trying to learn, like as a 17 year old, just trying to fit in, you know, and really it took me a while to get comfortable there. So um, I think the last couple, First year was first year was challenging for sure, uh, and after that we got rolling. Like this year two, the seventy three seventy four Rangers were still a, it was one of those teams that, you know, wish we would like to go back and into a time machine and replay the those playoffs the end of that season because we had such a great team, so many great players on that team, and we did have a good team, 
but just things didn't stack up for us. And, you know, we were, we had all everything prepared to head the Memorial Cup that year, but just we ran into Roger Nielsen and his Peterborough Peets and kind of put a, put a, a cold shower on the party there. Uh, but uh, after that, and then it was just kind of like feeling our way. And I think the big change for me is uh, halfway through the, my third season there, uh, they made the decision to change the coaches. And Eddie left, and in came Jim Morrison. And Jim Morrison, that went back to the Jerry Forward type of coach. Jim was a great coach. I love Jim. Jim was he was very level-headed, very calm, explained things really well. And he, Jim was a defenseman, so he really helped me out. Like he would take you off to the side and explain things to you. And that really, I think, saved my pro career. Like that last half of the season, I think my stock went up a lot, and I, I played much better. Like after that, don't get me wrong. I'm not blaming Eddie for the way that I played. That was the way that kind of it took me a while just to kind of adapt to his ways, you know, but it's difficult when you come off the ice when somebody's screaming in your ear every time it takes a takes a bit of it takes a bit of adjusting to, you know. Eddie's track record in Kitchener is the stuff of legend. We still tell the story of the time he was so upset with the team that the bus stopped several blocks away from the arena on a road trip home. Okay, guys, you're getting off here, and by the way, you're taking your bag with you, and you're gonna hump it the rest of the way back to the rink. Well, that was kind of commonplace for him. Like he, he was a big believer. Like we'd we'd roll up into Sudbury or Peterborough or whatever. He'd stop the bus two blocks before the rink and get out and make us walk, just so we would be awake by the time we got there, right? So of course we had to dress up with suits and ties and dress shoes and everything else. So we're trushing through all this slush with our with our dress clothes on, and then showing up at the rink. But uh, uh, I'll tell you one one of my my favorite stories about Eddie. Eddie was an entertainer. He should have been. He should have been a. You know, he was a performer of sorts. But he should have been a, in a. I don't know, doing vaudeville or something. But anyway, one day uh, that I think it was the year two. Year two, we had the big big uh, big team, and Kitchener hockey sticks had just started up. So of course, we have to play with Kitchener hockey sticks. So anyways, we get going and. Uh, one day, Paul Evans, our captain, he'd missed the net twice in a row, and Eddie was just tore a strip off. And he said, and, and, but Evans looks at him and says, well, how are we supposed to be able to, to play hockey with crappy sticks like this? Eddie just looks at him, wah! Anyways, he goes into the dressing room. He comes back out with a broom, like a corn broom. He goes one-on-one -on, -one on Don Edwards, NHL all-star goaltender. One-on-one -on, -one on Don Edwards from center ice, and he tucks about six inches off the ice just inside the post with a broom. Anyways, nobody said anything anymore about hockey sticks after that. He made his point, you know. Of course, we gave it to Edwards. We gave it to Edwards the rest of the season. I said, how can you let somebody score on it with a corn broom, you know? Anyway, but Eddie was, Eddie was a guy that he had a lot of passion for his game, and I think away from the rink, uh, Eddie was kind of a fun guy to be around, but it just – you know, he was just a rough and tumble and hard nosed kind of guy. I'll tell you another story about Eddie. So uh, I got to uh, be quite good friends with Dave Chambers. So Dave Chambers coached around. He had a he had a legendary coaching career, and and uh, we got to talking one day. And it turns out that Eddie had coached him in Guelph, the old Biltmore's back in the day. So in year two of Dave's uh, career, like Dave, I mean, he was riding on everybody. But anyways, his uh, roommate, Dave's roommate. He couldn't take it anymore. He had a nervous breakdown and he went, he left the team and went home. And Dave told me, he told me that to this day, he still makes the trek to calling whatever year to Eddie's grave to make sure he's still dead. You know, so that's, <laughs> that's the thing. So <laughs> let's just say he had a, he had a, he had kind of a, an abrasive personality. So. That's incredible. You, you mentioned Don Edwards. One of those great players you would have played was Dwight Foster crossed paths with you, uh, Dave Maloney and, a guy by the name of, I don't know if you know this, Larry, but Joe Fortunato, if you go to the Kitchener Memorial Auditorium today, you'll still see Forch's name on a ba on a beam in the concourse. Oh, Mike, you're a beauty. You are. <laughs> I felt that. So that, that for our listeners, there's a bit of a story behind that. So Fortunato, again, he was a real character. You know, he was a very popular player in Kitchener. I never, never really panned out for him in the pros, uh, but he was a very good junior player and very popular with the people. I think it was the hair. I mean, he had the big flowing hair, you know, and, and uh, anyways, I took my youngest son. He'd never been to an OHL game. So uh, he was spending some time with me in the fall. So the, the, the Rangers people were, were nice enough to set us up with a couple of tickets. And we're walking around just admiring all the history of the Kitchener Rangers. And you can see all the names on the, you know, 
uh, Stevens, Maloney, you know, Foster. And then I see Fortunato on one of the beams there. I said, Fortunato. I said, what is he doing up there? I said, but I figured his dad sent a couple of his goombas down there and uh, kind of put a little pressure on the on the auditorium people to put his name up on the beach. Anyways, Joe was a great teammate, and uh, I had only good things to say about him. He was a fun guy to be around. We still talk to this day, Larry. And in fact, just recently, we had the 82 Memorial Cup team back in Kitchener to celebrate the first championship for the franchise. And the arena, at its core hasn't changed. It's been expanded upon a couple of times, but it is still widely regarded as that cathedral for junior hockey as a young player. What's especially nothing against Elmira, but they didn't have the nice rec center that they've got now, the Dan Snyder Memorial to play in when you were there. So what's it like for a kid coming into that kind of arena to play your junior hockey? Uh, it was a great experience. Maybe I have to understand that you know, being a local guy, I was in that auditorium quite a few times before I actually started to play there. So I remember my dad taking me to the games and we saw like Larry Robinson and Abby DeMarco and Walter Kachuk and like those guys like playing. Right. So so when I got the opportunity and as a minor hockey, we got to play in there once in a while. Not so often when you're playing in a place like Elmira, you don't get invited to big cities to all that much. Uh, but but I had I had been in there and played a little bit before. So. It wasn't totally, you know, uh, new to me uh, going in there. It's, of course, different when you're going in there and you're the one playing. You know, you're the one now going to be playing for the Kitchener Rangers. So this was uh, this was a pretty big deal. I think it was a really big deal for my mom and dad, you know, like being local and growing up and my dad going and watching all those great players for the Rangers and then finding his son playing there as well. So it was definitely a big deal for them. You mentioned Walt Kachuk's name. How did it feel ending up on the New York Rangers roster with the great Walt Kachuk? Walter was great. I mean, my time, my time in New York, I mean, I was essentially in the, in the, a minor leaguer. I played five years in the minor leagues. My time in New York, I was with the New York Rangers for two years. I played two games with them in the National Hockey League before I got traded to St. Louis. But I remember my first training camp uh, in, uh, in New York. We were out in Long Island. And uh, the guys couldn't have been nicer. Walter was such a gentleman. I don't know if he knew that I was an ex-Ranger or what it was, but um, I was fortunate enough that it was one of the top four draft choices. So I didn't have to go through rookie camp. So I got to go directly to the main camp. Uh, so I was right in the main dressing room right away. So I had on my one side, I had John Rattel sitting beside me on one side and Brad Park sitting on the other. And then Walter was right across the way. So I was just kind of like a kid in a candy store. I couldn't believe, like, I kept, like, thinking, man, I can't believe I'm playing here with these guys. Uh, but uh, I remember one night we went down to a place. Uh, Walter asked me if, if you want to go out for dinner. I said, no, Walter, no, I don't, I don't really. Of course, absolutely. So it was, uh, it was, it was Walter Kachuk, and it was Billy Fairburn, uh, Ronnie Greshner. Uh, I believe Dave was there. Dave Maloney was part of that group as well. And they took a couple of, like, uh, the minor leaguers. It was me and Joe Zanuzzi. Uh, and they invited us out to this place on Long Island called uh, Al Steiner's. And you walk in there and you right, right away behind the bar, they've got all these like silver uh, beer mugs with all the Rangers and all their names engraved on it. You know, so, of course, I had to take one without a name. But uh, but it was like we had four people waiting on our table the whole night. It was like it was it was magical. I thought, yep, this is what it's like to be a New York Ranger. So I, I kudos to Walter. I don't know if Walter would, uh, you know, but uh, Walter was was great. He was a great player and a great gentleman. You were actually drafted by both the New York Rangers and the Indianapolis Pacers in the or Racers, pardon me, in the in the WHA. How did that work at the time? Well, well, it was it was a, it wasn't a whole lot. It wasn't a very difficult decision. Uh, the Rangers, like uh, they offered me, a, they offered me a contract. It was a three way contract, if you can believe it. But they offered me a contract where the racers just basically said, well, if you'd like to come to camp, come along, but bring your own sticks and all your old equipment. You know, so so they just they didn't make me an offer. I guess they figured the Rangers were making an offer. They didn't want to get into competition. Uh, so it wasn't really a, a big consideration going to uh, Indianapolis. You mentioned kind of bouncing around in the in the minors for a few years. A couple of those stops, you run into another coach who's well known in the game, and that is. John Muckler. What was it like playing for John? You know, John, John was, John was great. You know, when I ended up, when I, I ended up going to Providence at that time, it was the Providence Reds. 
And John, was, that was the American League affiliate for the Rangers. And uh, I thought John was great. But, you know, there were so many guys within the team that thought that John was such a hard ass. They just thought he was the toughest guy and the meanest guy. <laughs> I just spent two and a half years with Eddie Bush. And I said, <laughs> Buckler, are you kidding me? This guy's a pussycat. You should have seen what I had a junior to put up with. But, but uh, John, John was great. John was also a very good teacher of the game. Like, he taught me a lot. Like John was, uh, he was uh, pretty much a minor leaguer and uh, a defenseman. So it worked out really well for me to, to end up uh, playing for John because I had a really, really great uh, first season uh, in, uh, in Providence. And I think John, when he, he played a big part of that. I mean, uh, he gave me confidence. He played me a lot. He always like, would take me off the side and explain to me things that he wanted to have done. And yeah, he was a tough, he was a tough guy. He was, uh, he was a disciplinarian. And, and if, you, if you showed up every day on time, and worked hard and did everything he could. He he had very few people with very few problems with people like that. But uh, we had one player on our team, uh, Jerry Teeple, who was kind of a legendary player from Peterborough. And Jerry, let's just say Jerry was the best friend of a lot of the bartenders in town. So Muckler, the way when we walked into the rink, when we walked into the dressing room, John's office was off the left, and he had a great big window right in the front of it and he could see down the hallway but he could only see like two spots like down in the dressing room so he made sure that teeple was in one of those seats so that he could see Teep every day so teep would walk in in the morning he'd have his sunglasses on you know like it'd be snowing outside but teep would have his sunglasses on he'd go in there he put all his equipment on and the last thing he did was take off his sunglasses and put them on and step onto the ice so uh it was really uh interesting uh, career like I got to play with some real characters and I, I often wonder I said I think the players today have fun but I'm not so sure how tight they are because uh, you know playing the NHL even the American League I'm not sure but uh, you know the money's a whole lot different it's a business they don't have that much time you got the traveling and everything else uh, but I can assure you like the the days we had playing in the American League and the Central League back in the day uh, we played some pretty good hockey but we sure had a lot of fun you know you just said something. It's almost as if you were listening to one of our broadcasts this weekend, Larry, because my partner, Paul Fixter, and I talked about that very thing, reflecting back again on that 82 championship team that was just celebrated, the stories we got from these guys, how close they were, the things they did together. And and Paul and I said the same thing that you just said. The biggest change has got to be the money. There's so much at stake now. It's It's like there's hardly any time for fun, and still you're playing a game. Yeah. Well, now the guys, I mean, they all have their mental coaches, their off-ice coaches, their stick handling coaches, their skate. I mean, they have so, so many draws on, on their time, you know, and I know they only have, they're only allowed like so many hours a day to be at the rink type of thing, but outside of the rink, they're still expected to, you know, perform and do all these other duties. And I think too, the fact that um, like now in professional hockey has become a real melting pot, like from players from all over the world, so it would be a real challenge to kind of build that uh, homogenous type of group, you know, that we had back in the day. Because for the most part, you know, I remember the Rangers, like, you know, we, uh, Rick Chartraw being an American, he was kind of an outsider, you know. So, uh, wow, an American for the Kitchener Rangers. But pretty much everybody else within the team uh, were all small town guys, you know, and uh, they got along. Everybody got along really well. And, and the same thing, like going in. In my years playing pro in the U.S., um, for the most part, they were almost all Canadians and Americans. So, I mean, it was it was much easier, I think, to to, to build that type of of uh, team chemistry, you know. So uh, today it would be a huge challenge. Like the coaches, it's it's uh, coaching is, at any time is, is challenging, but today's hockey, coaching these guys that are making five, ten, twelve million dollars a year and and trying to build that, you know, trying to hold everybody accountable. And trying to make every, you know everybody feel like you know your fourth liners, you're trying to make them feel like they're superstars. It would be a, a very very difficult challenge. I know that particularly for a defenseman, we always talk about having to have one's head on a swivel. Playing as a defenseman in that era, Larry, what was it like? How much more aware of your surroundings and your place on the ice did you always have to be? Well, when Wilf Paymont was on the ice, you had to have your head on a swivel and know where he was, you know. So. Otherwise, he was going to take it off. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think the game itself is pretty it's, it's pretty much the same. It's just a whole lot faster. I mean, today's athletes, they're more skilled. 
they're quicker, they're stronger, they're, they're better conditioned for sure. I mean, going into Kitchener, like even the, the three years I was in Kitchener, I, I like when you talk about off ice training and preparation for training camp, you know, I would get a letter. I could show you the letter. I get a letter from the kitchen rangers from Eddie saying, well, you know, a series of, of running and calisthenics will get you in good shape. See you, see you in training camp. And that was pretty much it. You were left on your own. So, uh, but the game, getting back to the game itself, uh, I would love if you could have any clips of us, the 73, 74 team, uh, to see some clips of that, to see what it looked like, you know, because as we remember it, I mean, that was the top level junior uh, hockey in the day. You were, you know, one step below or step and a half below the National Hockey League. And uh, I mean, I remembered it as really good hockey is moving pretty fast. But when you watch the game, how it's played today, I mean, it's 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 a, it's a different type of game in that way. But the game itself, the, the basics of the game are still pretty much the same. How much different was it when you made the decision to leave North America and head over to France? Yeah, it was it was definitely um, it was uh, something I had to think about for quite a bit. But basically, it came down to this is that that um, I wanted to play in the National Hockey League. And after five years in the minors it became quite evident to me that that wasn't going to happen. So and I just didn't want to play in the minors anymore. And I had a couple of friends of mine that had left a year earlier. Uh, one was playing in Switzerland, one was playing in Austria. And uh, at that time you were writing letters, right? So you were writing letters back and forth. So they said, Larry, is this is great. Uh, as we know you, I said, I think you really, you would really enjoy it. So that was pretty much what decided it for me. I said, I want to go try something new. Uh, so what I did back then, there was no agents or anything like that. There was no internet. Uh, but basically what happened is I got, I got all the addresses of all the first, uh, first division teams all over Europe, Finland, Sweden, France, Denmark, whatever. And I wrote, I put together a little resume and I had a couple of letters of recommendation. One of them was from uh, Mr. Emil Francis, uh, from the St. Louis blues. And he wrote a very nice letter for me. And I think that opened some doors for me because then I got three offers out of that, uh, one in Denmark and two in France. And then the one that I went to in France was Grenoble. And the reason I chose Grenoble, because it was I'd never been to Europe before, but I knew Grenoble from the 68 Olympics. So I'd at least I'd at least heard of, of France and Grenoble. So uh, I just said, OK, here we go. And uh, that was the start of an adventure for sure. That's amazing to me. Thinking back, you basically had to apply for jobs all on your own, just like the old fashioned way we would do it if we wanted a job at the local coffee shop or something. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, and then started going back and forth and on my resume, I have to say on my resume, I put on my resume that I spoke English, French and German. And I'm thinking, well, wherever I sign, I got the whole summer to learn the language. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I did take some French in high school. And the last year, the last year I played, I played in Fort Huron, Michigan, was in the International Hockey League. And I was going to St. Clair College or taking a German course. So I, I, I had a little bit of a language background. Uh, but as soon as I got on that plane and they started talking French, I was kind of like lost, you know. So uh, and but what, what I was doing, though, too, is with on my my team in Fort Huron, uh, one of my teammates, Serge Menard, was from Quebec. So he was my translator and he was the guy writing the letters for me. But when I look at those letters afterwards, his French was so bad. It was pretty <laughs> bad. But. I, they had to believe that it was for me because it was so bad, you know, like this guy from Ontario, you know, is this, this looks believable, you know? So uh, that was an adventure like landing. I, I my timing was exceptional. Uh, but you can imagine I ended up, you know, all the horror stories I heard, like I filled up a great big trunk full of stuff, my essentials. Well, first of all was my albums. I had to have my music and I heard the toilet paper in France was terrible. So I put about 24 rolls of toilet paper in there. I took my own toilet paper with me. And uh, anyway, I ended up, I have to fly into Paris. And at that time I had to fly into Charles de Gaulle, the big international one. And I had to switch airports to go over Wasi to get on a bus, to go to Wasi, get on another plane and then fly into uh, Grenoble. So, and then my French was so limited, but you can imagine like what an adventure that was like just trying to figure out, you know, where we go. Cause there's no English anymore. Everything was in French. Uh, so that was, a, that was the start of an adventure. And I was in Grenoble then for three years. And as I said, my timing was excellent. Uh, we won the championship uh, our first two seasons there, the first two times uh, that that team had ever won. And actually, we just had a reunion. Uh, I was invited back to Grenoble in the beginning of December. It was the 60th anniversary of the club. 
and then through the through the winter they were inviting certain teams back and that and that uh that um uh that, that particular weekend beginning of december they were invited back the two championship teams from uh, 80 uh, 81 and 82 so that was kind of fun i've seen guys i hadn't seen for 40 years you know so i made sure to take a look at the team picture ahead of time and go through all the names and stuff but overall, I think everybody, all the guys looked pretty good. And we had a we had a really good time. It was really great to see everybody together. But getting back to your question on that, is that, uh, yeah, it was just being proactive and just deciding this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. And then just chasing it, just chasing it down. And then once you get to Europe, you become part of that country club. You know, like when you're in the United States, you're in junior hockey or whatever, like the coaches especially, once you're inside kind of that group, you can generally, if you're, if you're successful, you can move around within that kind of group a little bit. And that's what it was like going to France. So uh, when I was in Grenoble for three years and then, then I, I decided I, I, I wanted to, to change up and I had a great offer from a, a club in the southern part of France called Gap. And uh, we were in Gap for five years, loved it. Uh, right in the southern Alps region, a beautiful area. My two oldest children uh, were born there and uh, we had a great time. And then after that, uh, when, um, I decided to get into coaching, uh, we moved up to Rouen, uh, which is just West hundred kilometers West of Paris. And I became a player coach. And that was really kind of fun too, because I wanted to get into coaching, but I still wanted to play. So at that time in France, there was, there was only two of us, I think in the league. I mean, it was kind of on the way out, but you still had guys that were playing and coaching at the same time. So my president in Rouen, he figured, Hey, for the same amount of money, I'm getting a coach and a defenseman. So uh, it worked out. Uh, and what I, I tell people, I said, being a player coach is great because if you're on the bench and you get really frustrated about on something, you can jump on the ice and knock the piss out of somebody. So I uh, said, so that's that's the biggest advantage to being a, a player coach. Uh, but and then after that, then I, I was I think I left. I was 38 uh, when I hung up my skates and uh, just became a full time coach and then moved to Switzerland. And that's a whole other adventure there. How much uh, Reggie Dunlop was in you as a player coach? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Reggie, I, I can tell you this. The most difficult thing for me uh, from going to be a player to a player coach was that I had to separate myself more from the team. And like anybody that knew me or ever played with me, I was always in the middle of everything. Like, you know, any kind of gag, any kind of party. I like sitting around having beers and talking with the guys and, you know, just – just being part of the guys, I think. And I found that difficult uh, because like the first years didn't change so much, but I just really came to the realization that as time went on, I had to pull myself away from that and become more of a coach and less of a player. And that to me was the most difficult part of the whole thing. I was uh, fortunate to have some good assistant coaches with me that would help run the bench during the game. And generally I would let them run the forwards. I would run the defenseman and it worked out pretty well. So uh, my time in Rouen, we won four national championships in six years. So uh, we, we did pretty well, and we, and we went to the European Cup Finals twice. So it really kind of launched my coaching career, and it was the successes that we had in, in Rouen that really got me the opportunity to go to Switzerland, and that was a whole other level. And we'll get to that level in just a second, but I'm, I was thinking on the stops you were just talking about, Larry, and how many there were. And we've got a name for guys like that in the game, right? We call them suitcases. How many times have you packed and unpacked and moved the family around? You know, I was fairly fortunate that way in that uh, there was not a lot of, you know, start a season with one team, get traded to another, then get traded to another. You know, when I went to Europe, I was three years in Grenoble, five years in Gap, six years in Rouen. So I had fairly lengthy stays. Now, when you become a professional coach, especially in Switzerland, you know, you have to be able to move relatively, you know, quickly and uh, and sometimes often. But I, I I had a fair amount of success, so I was pretty fortunate. That was two years in Zurich, and then I was four years uh, in Ombre, another two years in Zurich, and then four years in Lugano. So I had some pretty good stints there, you know. So uh, later on in my career, I was moving around probably a little bit more, but that was more out of choice where – where, you know, I went to Norway and I knew I was only going to go to Norway for a year, but I just wanted to try it. I wanted to try something different. I'd been in Switzerland and, and the NLA for 13 or 14 years. And I just felt like I was, I was kind of like that gerbil on the, the spinning wheel, just kind of running faster and faster, but always in the same place. So I went there. I went to Austria for a year. 
and then then it went back and then I went back to Bern. I was back in Switzerland for a while and then the the this uh I think uh, and then I ended up going to Germany uh for a year and again it was just the way it worked out then I ended up going to Modo in Sweden and that that didn't work out and that's unfortunate that's that's another story maybe we talk about that later uh but yeah I think relatively speaking for as many years as I was in the game you're going to be moving around uh so as many years as I was in the game I was pretty fortunate to to have some pretty good stays in some places you know I'm thinking back on what you said about that 73 74 season in Kitchener when Roger Nielsen and the Peterborough Peets got the better of you in the playoffs when you thought you had a, a team that would be able to compete for a championship and if you could do that one again and then comparing it to what happened when you went to Europe and all of this success Larry could you imagine what would have happened if you had not like that seems to be a real milestone in your career the 73, 74 Rangers? Well, no, just like when you went to Europe, like all of the success that followed you, right? The championships, the European Cups, you name it, it all started. If, if you hadn't made that decision to go to Europe, who knows? Do you ever think back on that? Oh, I think back on it. I mean, I think back that 73, 74 series. I mean, when you think about things you should have done differently, um, I remember at the start of that series against Peterborough, uh, Stan Jonathan grabbed Dave Maloney and really, really wailed on it. I mean, really, and Dave wasn't, Dave uh, Dave could fight, but he wasn't a fighter, you know? And uh, nobody stepped nobody stepped in and challenged Stan. And Stan, if you remember Stan, Stan was about five foot eight with high heels on, but he was like a, he was like a fire hype. I mean, you could punch Stan 10 times, and if he got one shot in, that's all he needed. And of all the guys that I fought in the OHL, and I fought all the I fought all the big guys, I fought all the tough guys. Stanley was the one guy I didn't want to mess with because I saw him, I saw him with Chartres. He's he like and Rick Chartres was a good fighter and a big dude. And uh Stan just he shocked the crap out of him the one day. And honestly, Chartres or I should have gone after Jonathan. We should have gone after him right away, just to set the tone. And that that changed the series. They got on confidence, they got on a roll. Uh, you know, obviously for Dave, it wasn't a great start for the, the playoffs for him, but uh, that's that's for sure one thing should have done differently. So Stanley, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> meet me out meet me out behind the place out there. We'll have a go to here. You still gotta you gotta atone for that 50 years later. I got I gotta make up for it. Even if I get my nose broken another couple of times, that would be okay. But let me just say this about Stan Jonathan. Stan Jonathan, I have the greatest respect for him. I mean. He made he made a career in the National Hockey League just out of hard work and toughness. I mean, I don't think anybody anybody played the game a pound for pound that was tough as tougher than Stanley was. And uh, so, Stanley, if you are listening, kudos to you, brother. How hard was it for you, Larry, to play that role? You said you never backed down from any of the big guys on the other teams. You know, it was not it was not hard for me because fighting is something I always kind of did, always since I was a peewee. You know, and it's something I really enjoyed as a part of the game. I enjoyed it. And actually, a lot of people that make the comment that said that Larry was a better player without his gloves on than with his gloves on, <laughs> his gloves off than with his gloves on, you know. So, uh, no, it was it was it was always just kind of part of it. And I I, I enjoyed it. It was a part of it. But I don't I, I didn't want to play the role of a goon, like just to be sent out to go after people. Uh, I knew what my role was, and and again, that's that's the one time I did not I did not uh, I should have stuck up for my teammate uh, that particular time. So, but uh, I learned a lesson there, and uh, afterwards, uh, anyways, we had a lot of good fun doing that for sure. Do you think there's still a place for it in the game today? I think so. I I, I think I think there is. I think it's it's part of hockey, but you know, people think are crazy like. When, when I talk about the Kitchen Rangers, like playing OHL Judy, like we'd have at least one fight a week, like, like in practice, you know, like there'd be, there'd be, you know, and then, you know, guys would, you know, bump hands or whatever, and it'd be over. But uh, it was just something that was just uh, more of a part of the game. And uh, I think there's a place for it, but I think that, I think there's a place for it. Now, once we got out of the dark ages of the NHL, I'm talking about the Philadelphia Flyers back in the seventies and that, where that was just pure intimidation. I think now when, when players are, you know, the players, the fighters can generally are decent players. I mean, there's not too many guys in the league that look way out of place because they're great. They're, they're great fighters, but uh, they cannot play. So, I mean, I think right now I think of, of uh, Curtis McDermott, 
So Curtis, I've known Curtis since he was a little boy. So uh, his dad and I were good friends, like growing up in the Salva Beach area there. And uh, Curtis, arguably, probably the best fighter, if not top three in the National Hockey League right now. But Curtis can play. I mean, he's he's six foot five, like he's a manster. But you you take a look at Curtis, like with his like in a bathing suit in the summertime. Like you, this guy is chiseled, right? Uh, but he's a guy that just worked his butt off, worked on his skating, worked on his game, and he can play. He's not just a fighter; he can play. You mentioned earlier that you'd had the chance just before Christmas to go back to Grenoble and celebrate with the championship team over there. I, I believe just earlier this year too, not too long ago, since we're sitting down here, you were over in Switzerland celebrating a bit of a reunion as well. Yeah, I just got back actually. So I was invited back. We had the, uh, the retirement ceremony and a sweater hanging for one of my ex players uh, that I coached in Bern. So we won a championship together in 2010. Uh, so they just retired his Jersey. So the club was nice enough. Philip wanted to have me there and the club was nice enough to invite me back. And, you know, they, they paid the whole shot. And I said, sure, I'll come along. It was a great party. Uh, just, to, again, to to be uh, with all those people. When, when you win a championship, and you can go back to the 82 team. So that was uh, that was Scott Stevens and that crew, right? So that's, uh, those my, uh, those guys have a special bond. You know, so that was Sean Burr. I think Sean Burr was on that team yep. as well. And uh, But anyway, when those guys, when you talk about those teams, they have a certain bond. Having, having walked through the fires and come out the other end with a championship, it creates a certain bond. So when you go back and you, you, you get a chance to be around the guys again, you, you automatically get some of that feeling back again. You, you kind of flashbacks of, of, uh, of what great times it was and how wonderful it was to win that championship. You were, you were talking earlier about being a player coach before becoming just a coach, having those great assistants that helped you make that transition. Did you know that's where you wanted to head to in the game? You know, it's funny, you know, I never I never really started out planning on being a lifer in hockey. It just kind of worked out that way. So I know that there's a lot of professional, ex-professional players that have a tough time dealing with that. You know, when they go from their playing career and all of a sudden their playing career comes to an end, it's usually fairly abruptly. And all of a sudden now they have to get into the real world, get a real job, and then just kind of be like everybody else where they don't have the same support system. You know, they don't have that team. They don't have like all the managers and people like kind of helping them. Now they're on their own. They have to do their own thing. And I remember talking to one of my ex-teammates at uh, one time and I bumped into him about, oh, 10 years after like we played together and he'd retired and he was selling vacuum cleaners in the Kitchener Waterloo area. And, and he said, he told me, he says, you know, Larry, he says, you might think this is kind of funny, but I get the greatest kick out of, of selling when I close a deal and selling them when these people are so excited about this, this vacuum cleaner and I close a deal and sell that black. And it's like, I just won the game. It's, you know, you get that same type of rush, that adrenaline rush after when, you, when you're having a great game and you win the game. So uh, there's a lot of a lot of players that come out of that have a tough time dealing with that because they miss the camaraderie. They miss that rush, you know, that all the adrenaline that's pumping, like during hockey games, playoff games, all that stuff. That's what you miss. What made Sweden and Moto an attractive proposition for you? And, and why didn't it work out? Well, yeah, it's... Um, well, first of all, when you have you have a guy like Peter Forsberg, you know, Peter Forsberg called me personally to invite me to come to Moto. And uh, this is Peter Forsberg, you know, so uh, I met with the GM, the GM. I was coaching in Germany at that time. The GM come down. We hit it off really well. We spent he was there for two or three days, I think. And anyways, it was always something was on my bucket list. I wanted to do that. I wanted to coach in Sweden because they don't have very many Canadian coaches that have gone there. I think I was the first coach in, I think, 20 years uh, that had been in, in the uh, the SHL, the Swedish Hockey League. And I was the first North American coach ever for Moto. Like, Moto is one of the most traditional teams in Sweden. So they produced Peter Forsberg, the Sedins. Uh, it just kind of keep going on. Matt's Sna or, uh, Marcus Naslund. Uh, you, you keep going on uh, about all the great players that have come through that club and the traditions in that club. So it was an honor for me uh, to go back and, and then jump into to coach that team in moto. So, you know, why it didn't work out. I mean, I could we could we could talk for half an hour on that. I mean, I have to take my responsibility of the part of it. When you go into a new league, you know, it's kind of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. 
you know, so you come in with some ideas, you have to figure out, okay, that doesn't work. I got to change that. And then you kind of get things going. But bottom line is, is that we started, the biggest mistake we made was we started with two unexperienced 21 year old goaltenders. And it was just too much pressure for these kids. They're both great kids. They both worked hard and they just didn't have anybody to give them any kind of direction. So, you know, when your goaltenders are playing in a league like that, when they're around 80, 85, 86% save percentage, it, it's going to be difficult, you know? And then we, we just ran into a whole bunch of injuries. It just, it was just, it was just unfortunate because we got off to a pretty good start for Moto. They had finished like last and second last for two years in a row. And after eight games, we were like four and four. So we were kind of middle of the pack and everybody was happy. But then I think we lost six in a row or seven in a row. And all of those we lost, I think five out of six or six out of seven, we lost by one goal. And it was just, you know, things just, it, it, and it's craziness. Like, you know, I mean, we're getting into games where I'm looking to the heavens thinking, are you trying to tell me I shouldn't be here? You know, like some of the stuff that happened. But I will tell you this. I, I, I loved uh, the people I worked for, worked with. Peter Forsberg is a first class, first class person. Uh, and the people within that group, like at the management level, were very, very good. Uh, the players were fine. I mean, it was just kind of learning to, you know, work together, you know. So, uh, but yeah, so. When Peter called me, they said, well, they wanted to change the culture within the club. Uh, he just didn't tell me I only had 15 games to do it, you know. So <laughs> so that was a that was a quick accent. So definitely the biggest disappointment in my career by far, not even close, uh, because I, I felt like I let a lot of people down, especially other North American coaches. Uh, so a lot of people say, oh, yeah, like a North American coach, they can't coach in Sweden. You know, it's totally different. And there are some things that are, are quite a bit different, but still hockey. And I mean, you still have to figure stuff out. And uh, that that is for sure one, Mike, I would love to have a redo on that one there. We would make a, we would make a, a few changes, do things a bit differently, for sure. It's always been said, Larry, that coaches are hired to be fired. But do you ever get used to it? No. Yeah. It's never, it's never fun. And uh, I mean, I was relatively, you know, uh, unscathed until I got to Switzerland. You know, like all my time in Rouen, like in Rouen, I was there for six years. And basically I left because I just decided I was going to leave. I, I just I just felt I was stagnating there and I wanted to do something different. Uh, so once I get to Zurich, I mean, Zurich was a team. It was a real problem team. Like no coach had finished two years there in 25 years. You know, so, you know, you're kind of thinking, you know, how this story might end before you step into the situation. But um, when it actually comes down to it, and it's a crazy story anyways, how it did. But anyways, we had we had two good years there. Uh, the start was, the start was a little bit rocky. Uh, I signed a two year deal going into Zurich and then, uh, you know, after 12 games and, and this was in a 36 game schedule after 12 games, we still hadn't won a game. We had three ties and there's games we should have won, but we did not And it was just kind of, you know, just changing the losing mentality and changing the culture. And then we, we won 13, we won 14. Then, then we started to roll and we actually made the playoffs. So that was kind of like kind of save things going. In the second year, we actually had a pretty good season. Uh, but after at the end of the season, it was time to move on. But what happened then uh, is that uh, I say sometimes, you know, one door closes, the other one opens up. And I ended up going to Ombre. And uh, the four years we had in Ombre were four of the best years that I've had as a coach. It was still one of the best jobs I ever had. Uh, I had some incredible players to coach. We had some really tight teams. Uh, we won. We won. We, we said it about. Well, in year three, we set a new record for wins and points. This is Ombre that never, you know, this is a small, this is a village of 400 people. So, and we ended up winning two Continental Cups and a Super Cup. We beat uh, Magnetogorsk. We beat uh, the Russian uh, champions in a one game, all take all for Super Cup. And we were European champions with a village of 400 people. And it was really an incredible success story and so proud of everything that we accomplished there. And uh, it was really a, a special time. And that kind of set the stage. And then I went back to Zurich. So they called me back. Because I remember when when uh, I went back to Zurich the second time, um, my friends, they said, when I when I told them I was going back to Zurich, they said, well, didn't they fire you the first time you were there? I said, yes. But they said they were sorry and they promised they wouldn't do it again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that year, that first year, we won the championship and we won another European Cup. It had never been accomplished by a Swiss team before. So you're thinking, okay, things are going pretty good. Well, this is Zurich. So the next season starts, bang, injuries. I had Mark Streit on my team. Mark Streit went down in, uh, 
in the, the in the preseason. I lost three of my, my top defensemen before the season even started. Anyways, you could kind of see the train coming down the tracks. So I think two months into that season, I got fired. You know, and uh, so that's just it's 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 the way it is. But you never get used to it, and it's never fun because it's one thing for a coach. You know, I changed. There's one time like when I was in Bern, uh, we we my my first year in Bern, finished in first place, won the championship. The second year we finished in third place. We lost in Game Seven of the semis in overtime, and so two pretty good seasons. So we start season three, and we're in third place. You know, doing okay. And then uh, we lost three one-goal games in a row, and I got fired. And uh, the last one was at home in overtime by a knuckleball from the blue line that my goalie could have stopped with his bare hand. But anyway, what happens then, the next morning, uh, the manager from Lugano calls me up, and he says, well, we can't understand what's going. How about coming back for Lugano? I'd already been in Lugano before. We, we'd, won, we'd been in Lugano and won a championship there, so – so, and they said, uh, and I started laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? I said, the next game that Baron plays is Tuesday in Baron against Lugano. So they wanted me, I was going to be coaching Saturday night. I got fired Saturday night. They want me back on the bench Tuesday night in my rink coaching for the other team. So it's just, it's sometimes just crazy how things go. But what, what people don't understand or they don't realize is that like there's a whole family and a whole other bunch of people behind that affects that, that has a great effect on it. So when, when I change jobs, when I go into a new dressing room, I immediately have a support group. I have, you know, the, the medical corps, all the, the, the staff, the office staff, and the players. So you walk in, you're, you're good to go. But, you know, for my wife and my children, they've got to move. They've got to find new doctors. They have to go to a new school, make new friends. So it's really disruptive for the family, for sure. And I think I know marriage uh, is, is um, it's, it's at best a 50-50 shot for most people. But I think for professional coaches, it's much less than that, uh, just because of all the stresses and strains and moving around and all that stuff. And, and it takes a special, special people to be able to support that. But I always felt the support from my wife. We're now married 42 years and uh, and my children. So uh, they, like, except when my when we moved from uh, Omri back to Zurich after four years down there where my daughter was about 13 years old. And I told her we're moving back to Zurich and I had to move her out of her school and away from her her friends where I was just like Genghis Khan. I was the worst father ever, you know? So, but that, that's the way it is, you know? So they, they look back now at their lives and think how, how blessed it was and how fortunate they were to, to, to grow up the way that they did. They all speak four languages. Uh, they've had incredible experiences. They, they, they're, they, they travel the world. I mean, they're, they're such seasoned travelers. They're all over the place. So, and mostly with their, with their jobs now with my oldest son and, and my daughter, they use all their language skills and they still do quite a bit of traveling. My son right now is in Taipei uh, with his company, and my daughter just got back. She she works out of Seattle, but flies back and forth out of Salt Lake. So they're all over the place. So very proud of my children. They're very accomplished. As you should be. That's that's a true testament to the family unit, Larry. I love to hear that. You know, in in listening to your stories about coaching, I hear the word culture come up quite a bit, and I, I watched this. TED talk that you gave that I absolutely loved. So let me bring this back to that 82 Memorial Cup team in Kitchener, since we brought it up a few times. And that team, of course, had Bellows and McInnes and Stevens and Larmer and Eagle. So so it won because it had the best players, right? What what makes a championship team, Larry? Well, that's 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 a uh, that's a great question, you know, and I think that it, it comes down to this. You know, if I was to ask you, if I give you, if I ask any players, okay, if I give you like uh, five things, let's say it's uh, talent, you need talent, you need coaching and tactics, you need, you need commitment, you need chemistry. I mean, there's, there's all these things that you need, but players will tell you straight up, it's not about talent. Nobody ever chooses talent. It's, it's like, what's the most important thing to having success? It usually comes down to leadership and commitment and team chemistry. Those three right there. And out of those three, it, you can't have any of that without your level of commitment. Commitment being number one. And so it's it's even though you have all those great players, and they had great players on that team, uh, but they were all committed. I can guarantee right now, having go back, if you talk to them, if you talk to Scott or you, 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 you talk to Mike, you talk to any of those players right now, you will say they had a tight group and they were committed to the goal. The goal was to win a Memorial Cup. 
And and that's what it really boils down to, you know, because nobody ever chooses when I when I when I talk to people about that, they say, well, how important is my my great coaching and my tactics? Not that important, really. And the level of talent, not that important. It comes down to leadership, chemistry and commitment. Those are those are the big three. And you cannot with anything or have success at anything without a certain level of commitment. I love how you said success at anything, because I think that does apply beyond the sporting arena, too, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, your kids I, I, are a great. It doesn't talent. matter what. If you're in the military, you're running a business, it really doesn't matter. Uh, if you don't have people that are committed to the common goal for whatever you're doing, you're not going to be successful. And we talked before about culture. So I, I've always said that the greatest responsibility for any coach is to create that winning type of atmosphere, to, to, to create a culture that these players, they know when they walk into that ice rink or they walk into that dressing room there's certain expectations and there's certain things that 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 they know that they can count on okay and that that comes directly from the coach you know about how he's going to run that team and the type of atmosphere that he's going to build around his team you know so players want to walk into a place where there's a certain amount of i don't I know if it's security is the word but a certain amount of consistency you know, where you walk in and you know, OK, these are the rules. If I break the rule, this is what's going to happen. OK, and that's the same for everybody. So accountability is something that goes along with it. But I can tell you this, Mike, every player I've ever coached, they will all agree that, yes, we need accountability until it's them being held accountable. Right. <laughs> so, so it's 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 something that, you know, as a coach that you have to you, you have to hold the line and you have to say, look, at this is what we this is what our expectations are. And if you come and you're going to play for this team, this is what it's going to be like. So, you know, here we go. And then uh, again, that's that that comes that that comes down directly from the coach. You've described yourself as a hockey lifer a couple of times in this conversation, and I think it's true because we've traced the roots all the way back to you know small towns in southern Ontario to where you are today in Midwestern United States. All this time in Europe, where you were behind a bench or playing, and and now hockey coach vision you, what are you selling software yeah I'm, i've become a i've become a sleazy software salesman. <laughs> so it, you know it's really funny uh when in my former life as a as a coach and, and player whenever i would call up anybody in hockey 95 percent of the time the people were happy to have my call and would take my call and get right back to me but now as larry the software salesman you know people are they don't respond quite the same way you know uh, but uh, it's been a, it's been a great adventure too. Uh, so, uh, with this so software that we've created, it really is a fantastic tool. I think we have, I think we have four or five teams in the national hockey league using us. And then, then an abundance of junior teams and pro teams and, uh, U S university teams. Uh, it really is something hockeycoachvision.com. Check it out folks. Uh, but it is a phenomenal coaching tool, but what it's done for me, it's allowed me to stay in contact with the game. So, Every day, like I'm thinking hockey, I, I'm I'm working with coaches from all over the world. I think we're in 37 different countries now. So, like for example, in Australia, we've probably got seven or eight coaches in Australia, about four or five in New Zealand, and it's amazing, uh, you know, where hockey hockey is is played. And uh, with our software, you can also it also works for ringette and uh, uh, inline hockey. So, you know, in places like for example, Argentina, Brazil. They're using it down there more for the inline uh, than they would be for ice hockey. Uh, but um, it's it's really fascinating to be able to work with so many coaches from from all over the place. So that that has been good. But I tell you, I have a lot more respect for salespeople now than before because I tell you, sales are tough. And if your main client are hockey coaches, good luck because I tell you, hockey coaches, and I'm one of them, so I understand it exactly. We are the most superstitious, stuck in our way bunch of people that you're ever going to find. And, you know, the conversation usually goes like this. If I talk to somebody that's 45 or 50 and I'll show them the software and they say, well, that looks really cool, Larry. But, you know, for me, I've got my book and my whiteboard, my whistle and my pen. And, you know, it's working for me. And I'll say, you're right. You don't need this. But your players, your players are going to love it because today's players, they're so information hungry. They want more and more information they, and they can handle it. You know, so when they see it, essentially. Uh, basically what we do is, is, uh, is I can create any type of drill or tactic and animate a 2d and play it back for my players or send it to them an entire practice of animated uh, drills that they see exactly what's going on. They, they grasp it immediately. 
So I said, how much time, if, if you watch any minor league, watch any minor league uh, practice, how much time does the coach spend out there standing in front of a whiteboard? Okay. They're talking to the players and then they mess up the drill and they got to blow the whistle, bring them back in and explain it again. So a lot of times the kids like the, the, that 2D drawing on a whiteboard, they just don't get it. Even I don't get it sometimes. I mean, coaches send me drills. I can't figure out what they are. So when you're able to, to send them a, a complete practice of 3D animated drills, they see it, they grasp it immediately because they grew up in that world, EA Sports and NHL 2000 and whatever. You know, they, they, they understand that immediately. So with our software, like now with the, the last team that I coached was the Italian men's national team. That was a couple of years ago. So and then the last few pro teams that I, I coached using the software is they all got the practice the night before. And I would show up the next day and I would post a, like a PDF of it on the board. We step on the ice and we go like we would do three drills. I would take a water break. I would explain why we're doing the next two drills. And then we do two more. So we mean five drills into practice and I haven't touched a whiteboard, you know, so you can, you can really get your pace of practice going in a, a really, really high level. And that's, that's the, the greatest uh, advantage to it is it's all about, you know, the, the learning curve of all these players and anything that you can do to help them speed up the process is a plus for sure. Hockeycoachvision.com. Check yes. it out, folks. You mentioned superstitions. I got to ask about this because Obviously, as a almost lifetime coach before I became Sleazy Software Sales Guy. But what? how many times did you wear the same tie, same socks, eat the same meal when he was on a oh. winning streak? <laughs> well, I have the one killer tie. It's still up in my closet. Should I get into a championship game? I still have it there. I haven't thrown that one away. So, oh, yeah. I mean, you get into – like I had, I had that like kind of a routine as a player, and I had my routine as a coach. And uh, it's, just, it's just part of – it's part of the superstition, but it's also mental preparation where you're mentally gearing up for the game. So it's a step-by-step -step approach to that. So you could say these are little, just little uh, milestones. So like milestones, especially during the day, you know, like before that, not so much. I mean, when I'm, when I'm coaching, I mean, I have a certain way of preparing the team, but on game days, game days, I wanted to have a certain structure for me personally, you know, so the game day, pre-skate or video or whatever, those would change. Sometimes we'd skate, sometimes we wouldn't. Sometimes my videos would go too long, most of the time. Uh, but uh, uh, but once then, okay, get home, I would have a certain meal. I would lay down a certain time. I would get up. I would do a certain thing. I would, you know, so it was all that mental preparation leading up to the game. And I think that uh, most athletes have some type of routine that they go through. So you could call it superstition. I, I prefer to call it just uh, just mental preparation, like just going, just having routine to help you, you know, get yourself mentally geared up for whatever you're going to be doing. I've kept you for plenty of time, but I, I need to ask one more because you've made me think of it, Larry, when you talked about calling coaches. A, a mutual friend of ours told me that when he was a kid, he would write to you for advice on how to play the position better, tips here and there, how to fight better in some cases, how we could do a better job. How important has it been for you throughout your career to pay it forward, to help the others that are kind of coming up behind? Oh, I, I'm, I'm big on that. And I think that uh, through our software, I mean, if any of our coaches, like we have maybe 1500 coaches uh, on our software, if any of the coaches, like they know that I'm an, I'm an open book. Anytime that they need something like a face-off play or an exercise or a drill for whatever, you just contact me. I mean, I'm, I'm big on sharing. Uh, I had so many people help me along the way. I think, you know, one of the, the guys we talked, we mentioned earlier, Roger Nielsen. Roger Nielsen was one of probably one of the greatest hockey people, okay, of all time for a lot of different reasons, you know. But uh, Roger was so dedicated to the game and he was such a great guy and he was just a fun guy to be around. And I remember, like, I started going to his coaching clinics in Windsor when I was still playing. And I'm thinking that I was thinking about getting into coaching. So I started of all the years that they, I think I only missed the first two. The very first coaching clinic that Roger had was at his cottage up in, I think up in the Coorthers or Halliburton. Uh, and that was by invitation only. And he invited all the NHL guys up there. They said, well, this is pretty good. We should have a, you know, a coaching clinic. So we started it up and it was down in Windsor. And that was kind of one thing I did every year. But Roger uh, in the first, you know, 15 years or so, uh, he would present on a different topic every year. And I remember other NHL coaches be, being there and, and just listening to him and then saying afterwards, I can't believe he's telling us all this stuff. 
I can't believe he's showing us all like all the stuff that he does. He's he's giving it to us. But that was the way that Roger was. He just he was all into into advancing the game. And uh, his his thing was anyways, he said, look, if a coach is doing his job, he's going to watch my team for one or two periods. He's going to have me figured out, you know. So uh, he said, if we're going to advance the game, the only way we're going to advance the game is by sharing. We have to share information and, and then work off of that. And uh, so uh, I had great mentors uh, when I was coming through uh, coaching and I continue and try to be that as well. So I enjoy uh, talking hockey with people and uh, I'm still uh, with the, uh, the OHL. I'm uh, one, I work with the advanced uh, two uh, coaching groups. So I've been with them now for almost eight to 10 years, I think. And I really enjoy going back and coaching coaches, probably more than coaching players. Their, their, their attention span is much longer. Than, than, than players but I enjoy working with young coaches and sharing whatever you know experience and a little bit of knowledge that I have about the game and uh, just enjoy being around hockey people and talking hockey this has been uh, an education in the game Larry and a real treat thank you so much for making time to do this well it's been a pleasure Mike and again uh, congratulations to you and your career uh, with the Rangers you're following in some pretty big shoes there uh, to fill from uh, from the people that uh, that went ahead of you, and uh, again for all the Ranger fans out there, and for the OHL fans in general. I mean, I'm very grateful for the the start the OHL gave me and, and the Kitchener Rangers, and uh, I'm very proud to say that yes, I am a former Kitchener Ranger. Look, kids, look where it can get you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could end up you could end up like me being a sleazy software salesman in the mountains of Utah. <laughs> Larry, you're a beauty. Thanks a ton for doing this. Okay, Mike, anytime.